Well, let us get started because it is now officially 3.30. Um, and we will hope that we maintain this. But anyway, welcome to the, um, and thanks for coming. Um, and thanks to our future video audience, Hello, future video audience. Um, this is the final OSU CHR Center for Historical Research uh, Crisis and Uncertainty event. Um, we've had two years of events. My name is John Brook. I must admit that I did think this up um, in the spring of 20, when things seemed to be going bad. And actually somebody left who was going to do a series on debt, and she departed for sunny Southern California. And I looked around me and saw a crisis. That's all I saw. Crisis, crisis, crisis. Um, in fact, the term permacrisis has erupted recently, but we, anyway. That's another matter. I want to, thinking back to those, well, I'll think forward for like a tiny second. Next year we'll have a series for two years uh, on anger run by Bruno Cabanas. So I hope you can all come. Uh, but I want to thank right now, I want to thank our, my steering committee of the last two years, of whom right now three of you are here. Uh, Jeff Cohen, um, and Dory Noyes, and Yang Zhang, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for your work. Um, and, and everyone else, we don't name, name names, who's not here. Um, and I, 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 uh, uh, I want to thank the staff um, who have made this thing work um, year after year. Uh, I've been director of the CHR for 12 years, um, and no longer the director, but still I know the staff make this thing happen. Laura Seeger is here taping. Thank you, Laura, for all the background tech work. Um, Missy Hathaway takes care of our business matters. Um, and uh, Jen uh, Jetson takes care, of the, uh, takes care of a lot of other things around the edges. And then we want to thank um, the department for supporting this. CHR started in 2006 as supported by the College of Arts and Humanities, I guess. Um, and that lasted for 10 years. But then they said, no, we can't do it anymore. And the department swung into action, plus an anonymous donor. So we have a little trickling of money um, and coming in um, uh, to support our operations. Um, what I want to do today is to introduce Ling Zhang, who is here from BC, uh, who did her PhD at uh, Cambridge, uh, who works broadly in um, environmental, economic, and political history of uh, pre-modern China, um, and in environmental in particular. Um, she has been a lecturer at uh, Newcastle, um, a ZIF environmental fellow at Harvard, at the Harvard Center for the Environment, a postdoc at the Agrarian Studies Program at Yale, um, and is presently a research associate at the uh, Fairfax Center for Chinese Studies, where she runs some big programs, one of which I must have that I saw and said, oh my god, I can't watch all of this. I, should, but I, I do want to hear how that went, the, 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 uh, the goodbye to Marx and Pomerantz, yeah. Um, and is the series co-editor for a series in, in studies, environment, and history uh, published by Cambridge. Um, and I am here as a supplicant. Um, I am an author. And um, I'm very happy that she still approves of my work. Um, her first book um, is The River, the Plain, the State Environmental Drama in Northern Song, China, uh, 1048 to 1128, and really is, is must reading for anybody interested in environmental history, first because of the tight story that she tells, but the other, the broader theoretical argument, um, which is that nature matters. Uh, and, and, and there are many actors on the historical stage, and nature and natural forces uh, should be should be um, accorded um, equal status um, as we live in a world where nature is getting more and more complicated uh, and coming back to bite us. We thought we lived in a, a flat, easy world, and now it's a much more complicated world. Suddenly, so we realize that in fact, it's a real thing. The floor. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really, really wish I could speak as eloquently as a John in you know, a freestyle, but I can't. So I will. I just simply type out every single word I would like to say. <laughs> so in a very boring style, I'm going to read out my script. 
But thank you, John and Professor Brooke, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Professor Ying Zhang, for inviting me, and also the History Department in Station Studies at Ohio State. It's a fantastic opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. And you're going to know why, because this is a brand new research, and I'm doing something I'm very unfamiliar with. So this is the first time for me to speak publicly about this project I've been doing secretly, high secrecy, <laughs> for years. So, um, the best thing is, um, obviously I know I have a multidisciplinary audience here, so the best thing is I can hear feedbacks from different directions, different perspectives. This is exactly what I need at this stage of writing this new book, so thank you again for having me. All right, so one thing I want to remind us is I'm going to show a video which is very dark at one point. So when I do that, I'm going to stand up and I turn off the front light. So when you see me standing up, you know what's happening. Okay, so all right. Um, uh, yeah, this is what I literally wrote out. <laughs> wrote out. I said, as some of you know, I was trained as a historian in medieval China, so I was always an armchair scholar. So, but for my re new research, I had to learn a great deal about modern China, and I also trained myself to do ethnography, <laughs> to follow anthropologists' footsteps. So I have to push myself out of my comfort zone to go out meaning traveling around China to explore different places and actually to talk to people who are not dead. And I'm not used to that. I was very afraid to do that. It was a huge adventure. Wasn't sure if I could actually do that ethnography. But the results went beyond what I expected. So, um, so today here, I am to share with you part of my adventure. So I'm not going to supply you a def definitive argument or a coherent or, uh, you know, uh, thesis for the entire book, but just really to share with you the new adventure, how I reinvent, my, reinvent myself as a new scholar to undo the old self. Okay, so April 2020, um, actually, if you don't mind, I think it's the best I turn off the lights. It will make the visual aspect do better. So this is only this part. Yeah, we don't need the back. It's only this part. Yeah. So you can see things clearer. I think it's very important. Or as you can see your Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. April 20, uh, uh, April 20th, 2022, 2 p.m., I found myself standing on the deck of a small fishing boat in the middle of a lake. Together with me were two men, a young men, Xiao Tong and Xiao Tang. Xiao Tong was a professionally certified diving coach. He and his student, Xiao Tang, were core members of the local Red Cross res rescue team. Their job was to go underwater. Just 10 days before my visit, the local police contacted them for a job. They went under a bridge and picked up a body of someone who committed suicide. It wasn't because of the COVID lockdown, rumors said. Business failed and no way to pay mortgage. So happened the tragedy. It was a young woman, very young, Xiao Tong, stressed and quite pretty. But Xiao Tong and Xiao Tang didn't take me to the lake for a job. They wanted to show me something else. With that particular site, they wanted, to, uh, they wanted me to experience another aspect of their life, their pursuit of a meaning that was grander and more significant than their own. The meaning of home, the meaning of a living in a planet full of a trauma and a creative resilience. About 2.30 p.m., preparation was completed after being approached by a government boat and briefly questioned by two officials from the Bureau of Fishing Management, we luckily found a way to avoid being searched or arrested. <laughs> then, oxygen tanks were checked, the underwater camera was tested. The two men put on double layers of diving suits which would protect them from hypothermia. Most important, the GPS identification of the correct diving spot was confirmed. Information like that was kept a secret among only a small group of divers and archaeologists who had access to the location. After making sure that I understood the safety protocol, the two men dropped into the water. How to click? Oh, no. Sorry about that. 
don't really know how to do this. Uh, okay. And then there's a little sound, actually, if you can hear clearly. Okay. Um, I watched them disappear into the dark green water. Then I immediately turned to the screen of an iPhone that was hooked up with an underwater camera. The camera was held in the hand of Xiao Tong. As he swam around, the camera's GPS function measured the surrounding environment in real time and it delivered data to the screen in my hands. I could see that it descended meter by meter. The deeper they went, the water temperature became lower. Between zero meters, that means water surface, and then 35 meters below the water surface, there was not much to be seen, except millions of water uh, air bubbles and the insoluble particles. Then, all of a sudden, things start to show up. My screen read um, a depth of 35.5 meters and a temperature of 11.3 degrees Celsius. Behind the veil of the air bubbles, there were wooden pieces, wooden frames. They looked like beams, roofs, windows, and joints made of the Maltese tendon structure. Some of them were delicate, uh, deliberately, uh, elaborately carved. They were apparently made for decorative purposes. And I have to wait until the next minute. So maybe we can just watch for a minute as I read out the next line. So when the depth hit 37 meters, a giant piece of stone popped into the light. On its a flat surface, scripts appeared one after another. First was a vertical line for four characters saying, Ding Si Wu Chun. The late spring of Ding Si year. Second was was a horizontal line of four large characters reading from the right to the left, Shi Xia Shu Yuan, the school of a stone gorge. Third was a vertical line of four characters saying, Nan Tong Zhang Jian, Zhang Jian of Nan Tong writes. So Zhang Jian was a real person. He lived between 1853 and 1926. In 1894, at the age of 41, he passed the highest level of the civil service examination as a Zhuangyuan, which meant the number one candidate of the entire empire. I'm going to stop this so you can focus on my talk. <laughs> okay. Um, that particular year, 1894, was when the first Sino-Japan War happened, and the Qing China was defeated miserably. We're talking about the late Qing dynasty during the reign of a Guangxu emperor. Surrounding the young emperor was a group of reform-minded politicians and intellectuals, including famous figures like Wen Tonghe, Kang Youwei, and Liang Qichang. Those men were determined to modernize China and turn it into a constitutional monarchy. They recruited like-minded men like Zhang Jian into the higher level of the governance. And four years later, in 1898, they assisted the emperor to carry out the so-called 100, day, 100 days reform, Wu Xu Bian Fa. Given the name, we know that the reform did not go well, did not last long. It did not end well. The emperor was put under house arrest, and the remaining years of his life was in tragedy. 
Many reformists were expelled and punished. But Zhang Jian thrived as the executive of the many reform policies at regional and local levels. He became one of China's most uh, forefront, uh, for foremost uh, industrial and business leaders, especially for textile and oil industries. But there was another reform policy and activity to which Zhang Jian made a significant contribution. That was education. He established and sponsored many universities and professional schools, several of which are still operating today. It shouldn't be too pres uh, uh, presumptuous for us to call Zhang Jian the father of China's modern education system. For this reason, it is not surprising that Zhang Jian wrote the name for a school the School of Stone Gorge, perhaps by invitation, and that his calligraphy was carved into the stone plaque that was hung on top of a gate of the school's campus. All this happened in the late spring of 1917, the year of Ding Si. But this 1917 stone plaque, however, lied a much uh, uh, behind, no, sorry, behind the 1917 stone plaque, however, lied a much older institution with a much older history. The School of Stone Gorge was established in 1174 during the Southern Song Dynasty, 743 years before Zhang Jian left behind his name. As early as the 13th century, the school had produced many prominent Confucian scholars and hundreds of winners of civil service exam exams. Many of its students became high-ranked officials. The school had achieved such empire-wide fame that Emperor Du Zong of the Southern Song, who reigned between 1264 and 1274, graced the school with his own calligraphy. Today, nobody knows where the stone carving of the emperor's calligraphy is. Perhaps it is somewhere in the lake. All we know is that what Zhang Jian introduced in 1917 was merely a very new addition to a very old institution. From 1174, when the school was first built, to 2022, when I saw part of it from the screen in my hands, more than eight centuries have passed. What's curious about this, uh, this entire experience is that the school and I were separated by a vertical depth of 37 meters, by a spatial realm filled with water. I drifted on the boat while the school lay at the bottom of the lake. The school was drowned. The lake was recently created. What used to be solid land, terra firma, enveloped by enveloped by oxygen-rich, breathable air, now lies at the bottom of a watery abyss. A past existence has become a ruin, accompanied by deep water fish, and only occasional visitors, like Xiaotong and Xiaotang. The history has vanished into the depth, forgotten by people, including myself, who busily make our terrestrial living on the land. Over a depth of 37 meters, the bodies of the rocks, beams, air bubbles down there, and the bodies of the boat, myself, and the iPhone in my hands up here, miraculously encountered one another. The vast time across 800 years were compressed into this moment as a lost world was suddenly revealed to my eyes. As I was standing in the boat, I felt that, as a professional historian, I had never been so intimate with history. That sense of intimacy was entwined with a sense of awe, horror, and sorrow. Those sentiments were so powerful that it made me want to throw myself into the water, to touch the deep realness of the past that is disguised by the vertical loftiness of the present. I wanted to be connected with that loss. I wanted to know why such loss. How did it happen? What does it mean to those who remain, such as Xiaotong and Xiaotang? What does a living with a trauma mean to our modern world, full of uncertainty and a potential for more traumas? These are questions that came to me, that came to my mind um, uh, on April 20th, 20th, the drive the inquiry, the spirit, and the mood of writing in my new book, 108 Meters. The book is a geological and ecological history of the East of China with a focus on the Xinanjiang River Valley, where I was born and spent most of my childhood. 
I write about the river valley's environmental transformations over a long period of time, from land formations in remote geological eras, to colonial activities in the medieval period, to the economic boom during the Little Ice Age, to the industrial construction during the Cold War, to the ecological experiments in our time of environmental degradation and climate change. By telling a series of stories about this river valley, some geological, some biological, some economic, and some artistic, I use my book to deliver a very simple message. Every history is a history of Earth. Every culture is an earthly culture. Every being, including human being, is an earthly being inscribed with the earthly imp the geological imprints. I'm not going to talk about more about this book. Um, I'm here to talk about something in the last, or perhaps the next to the last chapter of the book. The book's title is Geo Stories from Geo Trauma to Earthly Healing. Most of the research for the chapter comes from oral history that I conducted in the past two years, either uh, uh, virtually or in person when I travel in China. I'm not presenting a complete or coherent chapter here. I'm only sharing with you some of my ethnographic um, and oral history adventure so you get a sense of the stories that I try to tell. A little historical background is necessary. 1952 to 1956, several groups of geologists and hydro engineers arrived at the border between western Zhejiang province and the southern Anhui province. They were there to survey the Xing'anjiang River Valley, a mountainous region. They were looking for uh, favorable geological qualities that would allow the construction of a major hydroelectric dam, and they found them. The positive survey results they produced led to a grand proposal to build on this modest river one of the largest hydroelectric plants of the time. The proposal was approved by Chairman Mao Zedong, and uh, its execution was uh, supervised by the office of a Premier Zhou Enlai. Between 1957 and 1960, in nearly three and a half years, about 40,000 engineers, technicians, skilled workers, and their family members arrived in this river valley to participate in the construction. By the end of 1959, concrete infrastructure blocked the river, and the reservoir started to take shape. In the spring of 1960, the first turbine was installed and began to generate electricity. By 1955, the dam construction and the reservoir formation were fully completed. Today, the dam could be viewed from distance through drone imaging. And when I visited in the spring last year, it looked like this. I don't really have time to go into details, but I want to remind us we need to think of the complicated historical conditions under which this hydropower plant was built. I trust that we, most of us sitting in this room, know enough of the Cold War history and uh, history of early socialist China. So we're able to imagine why this dam was uh, celebrated as a major achievement of China's socialist construction, as a monumental piece of China's socialist nationalism. As a symbol of a patriotism and independence, the dam was given its last identity by Premier Zhou Enlai. It was a something made by China itself, something of our own, zizi. This victorious construction, however, could not be achieved without tremendous damage and loss. The standard narrative about hydropower plant, um, uh, by hydropo uh, hydropower dams, is about the submergence of land and the displacement of people. We know this narrative very well. When it comes to China, a great deal has been written about the loss caused by the Three Gorges Dam. This narrative is equally applicable to the Xinjiang hydropower plant. What we don't normally know is that, in fact, this particular dam set the record for the damage and the displacement many decades before the Three Gorges came along. 49 historical towns and 1,377 villages were drowned. 260,000 buildings and 200 square kilometers of farmland went underwater. 300,000 people were forced into migration. 
The vast reservoir collected a ne a nearly 18 billion tons of standing water that had turned 1,078 mountains and hills into islands. What made the damage particularly intense and horrific is the timing and the conditions under which it happened. We're speaking of a region that was historically highly developed, with a dense population and vibrant economy. It was a not a demographic or socioeconomic hinderland where the attack of a rising water would generate only limited impact. Between 1958 and 1962, China was in the middle of the Great Leap Forward movement, which was driven by the slogan, Duo Kuai Hao Shen, more, quicker, better, and economical. The slogan used the socialist construction to rush out grand projects like this one as rapidly as possible and to do so by reducing financial and material investments by whatever means. People work harder, work for longer hours, and were paid less than promised. Certain work needs to be done could not be done. For instance, there was little time to plan out peaceful migration. There was a no time, nor manpower, nor money to demolish settlements or remove belongings. Water rose quickly and violently. Many people were given only a few days to pack up basic food and clothes. Transportation means were limited. Many were forced onto roads on foot, carrying on their shoulders bamboo beams and wooden buckets with babies <coughs> sitting inside. The message used to motivate migrants was to, quote, bring more new ideas and carry less old furniture, unquote. No wonder that numerous pieces of furniture, just like houses, roads, and city walls, were abandoned, as you can see from this photo. And then they went underwater. This was very different from the situation for building other major dams in China or elsewhere in the world. The bottom of the reservoir of the Three Gorges and that of the Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam were demolished and cleaned, therefore empty. There's not much remaining to be seen. To make the damage and the loss even worse, starting in 1959, China experienced an extensive, horrific famine. Across the country, some 30 million people died, making the so-called Mao's Great Famine one of the worst catastrophes in human history. That particular part of China I'm talking about in western Zhejiang was not the worst in terms of food shortage in comparison with other parts of China. But as suffering the financial strain, the government had to carefully budget its limited funds and prioritize what it considered more important, such as the construction of the dam and feeding the workers. As a result, the financial compensation promised to the migrants were cut down again and again to a minimum level, driving many migrants into deep poverty. That situation had perpetuated over the next six decades until today and affected three generations of migrant families. The migrants' fight for proper reparations has never stopped. It is still going on today. This is why my research is kind of considered a little sensitive, and I was repeated a turn away by people in archives. People feared that scholarly research and a publication like mine might further arouse the dis discontent, um, uh, further arouse the discontent felt by the old migrants and their descendants. Let me make it clear: my book is actually not about this hydropower. It is about the long-term geological and ecological history of a region in which the hydropower plant plays an important role. What I have introduced so far has prepared for us a historical context within which I can introduce the concept of geotrauma. The kind of trauma that is not only produced by certain human events or human experiences, but is also intimately entwined with and conditioned by the changing circumstances of the geo. The prefix of geo can mean spatial locations with specific geographical coordinates. It can mean space, a sphere within which things take place. It can also mean place and emplacement that are imbued with human senses, sociality, culture, and identity. These are three meanings of the geo, familiar to all of us, are very important. But I argue that the geo also means geological in the broad sense, and it must stand for water, 
soil, rocks, wood, air, minerals, fossils, bricks, concrete, steel, and even bones buried underground. The various material beings inhabiting, inhabiting this earth. The geo must stand for diverse materialities of all these human and non-human things. It must stand for their different shapes, weights, textures, temperatures, colors, and actions, and the affects that are capable to generate. To produce geotrauma, therefore, is not merely to cause trauma at a location inside of space or in a place. It is to produce traumatic experiences and to endure long-lasting traumatic consequences together with diverse uh, diverse earthly beings that co-inhabit the same earth. For earthly beings to experience geotrauma means two things that I believe happen simultaneously. One, it means how various earthly things, such as humans, or a river, or a mountain, suffer external shock, then internalize the damage of such violence, and then enfold the long-lasting wounds deep into their tissues into their underbellies, and for human, into their deep down unconscious, as Simon Freud would say. The other, it means the breaking of earthly relations, the tearing apart of various geo ties that use the bound earthly things in a geological and ecological community for a valley to be submerged underwater and permanently separated from air is a geotraumatic as a river to be blocked by concrete infrastructure and thus have to search for alternative paths to release itself. For humans to witness how surging water swallows their ancestral tombs is as geotraumatic as a sea in mountains where they used to hike turn into inaccessible and lonely islands. Geotrauma is the both the trauma locked in the bodies of a various earthly things and the traumatic resonance or empathy shared by them. Therefore, geotrauma is the trauma that runs across the dividing line between human and non-human. These ideas and the specific definition that I give to my geo concepts became very clear to me when I stood on the balcony with these old men and women as they pointed toward the west and asked me, do you see that island right there? In front of that island of a dragon mountain, 70 meters below is my home. My home is gone, but I'm here, and I look at it every day. I can see it through the distance, through that water. That spring, last spring, I spent a good amount of time with this old man, Grandpa Yu, who is 87 years old. His family lived in the walled city, which was first built in the third century during the Three, three Kingdoms period. When that city went underwater in 1960, his parents escaped the flood with their younger children, including his younger brother, this man standing in the middle, who is a 10 years younger than Grandpa Yu. Brother moved, the brother moved out of the region and only occasionally come back to visit Grandpa Yu. Grandpa Yu stayed behind. He was already a young man and married to this woman on the left. He worked as a staff member at the newly built hostel in the newly built town for the county. As old towns were drowned, a new town was found, was founded on the foothill. Grandpa Yu was illiterate, energetic, and quite personable. So he was assigned to the hostel to be <coughs> working at a hostel's front desk. At that job, he received two kinds of guests, government officials and employees who came to the town to work, and migrants who came back here to look for their families and to see their water-covered homeland. Over years, the latter group became more and more numerous. They often found Grandpa Yu the first person they spoke to, facing a completely transformed landscape, or you could say waterscape. They returned, uh, the, the, these returnees felt lost. They relied on someone like Grandpa Yu for guidance. He could point out the directions over the open water to give them a sense of the whereabout of their lost homes. Grandpa Yu was a, national, uh, was a natural interviewer. He got people to talk to him. He also developed a habit of carrying a notebook and write down all the information he heard. Over decades, he cultivated an encyclopedic knowledge of the local affairs. 
By the time he retired at the age of 58, people suggested to him, now you are retired, so you have time. Why don't you write down everything? Or better, draw a map of the drowned world so the returning migrants could have something to look at. Grandpa Yu thought that was a great idea, so he followed it. Starting in the early 1990s, he became a frequent visitor to libraries and archives with a notebook and a pen in his hand. He hand-copied dozens of volumes of local gazetteers from the Ming and Qing period, word by word, up to three million characters. He relied on those historical records to construct a system of knowledge about the world lost to the water. Inspired by, inspired by the maps in those Mingqing gazetteers, Grandpa Yu thought of creating his own maps that he hoped would reflect the geographical situations of the region shortly before it was drowned. But never having had any drawing lesson in his life, he needed some art education first. So he bought a copy of a Jie Zi Yuan Hua Zhuan, a comprehensive introduction to the techniques of a traditional Chinese painting. The book was compiled by famous artists in the 17th century and has since been used by, as an art textbook by many, including myself, when I was learning um, painting as a young kid. Relying on this book, he kept practicing. He learned how to draw roads and rivers, how to depict the mountains of different shapes, and how to paint different kinds of trees and buildings. These images, with the dates on them, gave you a sense of the progress he has made over three decades as a painter and a drawer. <coughs> when acquiring both the historical knowledge and the artistic skills, Grandpa Yu also labored to gather information from migrants. Over three decades, he traveled to various locales across Zhejiang, Anhui, and Jiangxi provinces. Wherever he went, he carefully listened to people's dialects. Judging by the sound, what sound they made, Grandpa Yu asked them if they were the migrants forced out <coughs> by the building of the Xinanjiang Hydro Power Plant. To those people who were willing to talk to him, he asked, asked them to evoke their memories, the memories of their hometowns, how they looked like before the water made everything disappear, the memories of their neighborhoods and the people with whom they grew up and did business the memories of their livelihoods and activities, such as how they fished in the river, how they collected wild fruit, and where they shopped. The image on the left shows you how he conducted interview and translated oral information into pictorial representation. Over the three decades, Grandpa Yu visited more than 2,000 migrant households and produced a large body of a few notes. Here, I blocked off a lot of personal information for privacy concerns. For those of you who conduct ethnography, such as with Jeff, you must know how exhausting it is to take notes at night after long day's work. Personally, I found that traveling from place to place and making conversations with the strangers um, requires tremendous energy. So the past, last spring, by the time I got to meet Grandpa Yu, I was really worn out by my intense field work and had already stopped writing field notes. But this man, however, never stops. His persistent practice over 30 years has turned him into an ethnographic master who has produced a massive amount of information. Back at home, he processes such information in this dark, shabby room. He DIY'd a workstation, which is the wooden frame of, um, uh, of an old bed. Um, because the bed was uh, too low, as you can see, he found additional, um, uh, additional wooden board and he used many paper boxes to hold that up as his works, work, uh, desktop. We need to remember that this man spent his entire professional life as a staff member of a hostel. His family is not deep in poverty, but they are very poor. His work is not supported by any research funding. Every penny comes from his own pocket. When he spent days and nights working in this study, his wife was quietly sitting outside in the tiny kitchen <coughs> plus ba uh, bathroom plus a living area. They don't have TV nor radio. Without noise, the man can concentrate on his work. I don't want us to idealize a grandpa in here. Let's make the point clear. 
someone has to make sacrifice in order to allow an extraordinary man to do his extraordinary work. And that someone, as we know, often means women. Now you are looking at the products of his research. This is a small map um, depicts a suburb of his hometown, the city of Ho. He, produce, he produces a, uh, uh, he's produced a dozen maps of this kind. And this one is a very large, the largest map of all. It was finished in the summer 2020. Its original size is about 11 feet long. It depicts the entire lake with the hydropower plant located as at the southeastern corner. The title of the map is The Villages Drowned in the Xinanjiang Reservoir. The black lines refer to submerged roads, blue lines which you may not be able to see, you can see uh, vaguely, <coughs> refer to dozens of the major rivers and then their tributaries. The wash of the light blue color helps you imagine how those rivers are swelled and how water expanded <coughs> to form a lake of a, of a wild shape. The right half of the map, map name, uh, names the lost entities, including towns, villages, infrastructure, economic enterprises, historical sites, etc. It lists the loss of the populations associated with those entities. It even gives a brief documentation of the migration process. Everything on the map is handwritten and hand-drawn. Two things about uh, Grandpa Yu's maps are particularly interesting to me. The first is his desire to model after modern line maps and to adopt their cartographic techniques. He standardized various representational marks and signs, such as the width of lines and the differentiation of settlements of various scales and administrative levels. He wants his map to look as, quote, scientific and precise as possible. He wants his products to be able to stand the test of the time and of challenges from their viewers. Based on our uh, conversations, I get a sense that he was uh, challenged quite a lot and even ridiculed by people who despised him for his uh, low social status and his lack of educational credentials. They doubted his abilities and his credibility. The second thing interesting uh, interests me, uh, which is more interest, uh, which is more interesting to me, is Grandpa Yu's insistence on giving physical forms as concrete as possible to the bodies of geological entities, such as islands and mountains. This is particularly evident on his smaller maps. He uses the techniques of Chinese ink painting to portray mountains of different forms, different textures, and bearing different types of trees. As he explained, mountains in different parts of the region were different. People associated with the different mountains had different experiences. He wanted to do the best he could to be truthful to those geological and relational differences. I asked Grandpa Yu why he had spent, um, he had spent 30 years of doing all this, what he wants to achieve. Quite many people thought he was odd, doing things irrelevant to his status and place in the society. He pointed at the map and said, look, look, here, right here, 70 meters below is my home. Beneath that water is our land. They're still there. If you dive down, you will see them. I know there were divers doing that. My job is to remember. So young people like you who didn't experience that history and had no knowledge of our loss do not forget. Grandpa Yu's <coughs> maps are now collected by several museums, including a new museum in his county, which was opened during the COVID. The museum uses several digital panels to exhibit this large map. It also carves out a large room about the size of this, uh, about um, two, two, double the size of this room, to display a large diorama, a 3D model of the drowned town. That model was produced on the basis of the map in, um, uh, that we saw earlier. Through these public exhibitions, Grandpa Yu's ethnographic and artistic work is now known to tens of thousands of museum visitors, who are both tourists 
and the descendants of migrants. His work helps people visualize what was there and what was lost. Those mountains, rivers, trees, buildings, fields, people, animals, and how they used to live together and relate to one another. What, Mr., um, what Grandpa Yu has done is a storyteller by specific ethnographic and artistic means. What he tells, I argue, is, quote, a geo story, the kind of a stories that are oriented towards the geo and concerned with the coexistence and the entangled relations among various earthly beings, be them human or non-human. Geo stories, in the words of architects and scholars Renia Gossen and El Hadi Jazari, quote, bring into representation, into artist, uh, into aesthetics and politics, those things, spaces, and the scales that are erased from the geography, ima geographic imagination. Storytelling by Grandpa Yu brings back our life, our aesthetics, and our politics the forgotten history, the erased earth. Let me provide some kind of a, a conclusion. Grandpa Yu is one of the many people who I'm writing about in this chapter. Around the lake, across the valley of the Xinanjiang River, um, there are many people of three generations and of diverse regional and professional backgrounds. They have developed different skill sets and are making their geo stories in distinct forms. Some write books, some install exhibitions, some reconstruct historical temples and schools. Not all of them are natives forced out from the region. Many are immigrants forced to come here and stay. Technicians and workers coming here to construct the dam have lost ties with their families and their lands in other parts of China. Now in their 80s, they are writing books too, making films, and rallying to build monuments in order to show the public their versions of geo stories. They see themselves advocating for the interests different from those of the flood migrants. They even complain that both the public and the government put too much emphasis on those flood stories. And there are their wives, and there are their children, there are people who later moved into the region to take advantage of the brand new built environment. There are immigrants' children who grew up being educated by other immigrants, such as this girl who is in her 40s, who is trying to write the first academic book about this river valley in English. And this girl is the little me. <laughs> Next to me is my teacher who follow her husband, a truck driver, to migrate from North China to this place to participate in the construction of the dam. And there are people who are much younger than me. Some of them grew up having a basic sense of the history, whereas others having no knowledge but only getting to learn the history quite recently, including myself. Not only, do they, um, not only do they use their specialties to create geo stories, but they got, get to know one another and share resources with one another. Together, they form a small community that has something in common, that is, they care. They want to remember. They want the lost world to be represented by diverse means, either to be seen, or to be heard, or to be touched, or even to be lived again using different media and wielding different, um, different techniques, they, actually, <coughs> we, including myself, are telling one after another geo story that each seeks to give form to the formless, to give flesh to the disembodied, to give a material substance to the vanished. Such geo stories creatively resurrect the dead bodies, not only the bodies of the lost human beings, but also the bodies of the drowned towns, deformed rivers, and oxygen deprived, suffocated earth. In their thought provoking book, Arts of a Living on a Damaged Planet, feminist scholars of thinker Anatsen, Heather Swanson, Eileen Gan, and Neil Zabambat urge us to pay close attention to the various ghosts and monsters of the Anthropocene. 
those beings that were destroyed, marginalized, demonized, or forgotten during the relentless process of our pursuit of modernity. <coughs> Capitalism, <coughs> abundance, efficiency, that is our pursuit of a progress. Without knowing such eco-feminist philosophy or politics, storytellers like Grandpa Yu and many men and women who I've met are performing such philosophy and politics. They use their creative storytelling to make our world, this world of the Anthropocene, once again teeming with and haunted by history's ghosts and monsters, by their loss and damage, so we cannot escape history. A number of a black indigenous and anti-colonialist feminist scholar contemplates the power of storytelling as a quote, a form of a theory in the flesh. In her recent book, Dear Science and Other Stories, Catherine McKittrick, geographer, writer, and a scholar of gender studies, states that, quote, sharing story is critical, rigorous, radical theory, unquote. Thinking about along this line, I see people like Grandpa Yu as a theorists in the flesh, not theorists in abstract logic. They create, they create a fleshy, corporeal, embodied theory. Their creations reconceptualize how we should view the world, how we should identify our places in history, and how we would imagine, should imagine paths toward the future. But there is something more here, emphasizing the affective capacity of earthly beings and the affective power of storytelling. I found myself think a lot about violence and even more about <coughs> violences in cities, shadowing companion trauma. Violence may stop, but trauma persists. It can run across generations. I argue that geo stories like Grandpa Yu's help to release the deep buried trauma that was locked in separate bodies of earthly beings, such as a people, and a mountain, and rivers, and was caused by losing earthly connections. Geo stories work like talk therapy. Just as a talk therapy cannot fundamentally resolve trauma, geo stories cannot fundamentally resolve um, geo trauma. To fundamentally resolve geotrauma, we must address violence and injustice that happened in the first place. What geostory can do, and it can do powerfully, is that they do allow geotrauma to surface, to expose under the sun, and then to contagiously infect and affect a much bigger population. In a sense, storytelling makes geotrauma moves and permeates across boundaries until such trauma seeps into the public's collective consciousness and it becomes the public's shared burden. It's a through this process, sharing geotrauma, instead of erasing violence or repressing geotrauma, that people like Grandpa Yu and we all come form to all can form a new relationship with, or in the words of biologist and feminist theorist Donald Haraway, to make kin with one another. We can become empathetic co-inhabitors of Earth, and we can begin our common journey toward earthly healing. This is the politics I advocate at the end of my book. It's a neither cynical eco-pessimism nor naive eco-techno-optimism, but a realistic way of making a meaningful life with geotrauma, despite geotrauma. Finally, you may ask, so what exactly do the young divers Xiaotong and Xiaotang do? What is the <coughs> meaning that they pursue? When they, do, uh, when they go down to the lake, they always carry an extra tank not filled with oxygen but with normal air. They hook a spray device to that tank and then when triggered, spray air underwater. This is a trick they learned from underwater archaeologists. They use it to blow away biochemical deposits on those wooden and stone rules. Why do they do that? It's a form of underwater conserva conservation to slow down erosion and to allow the remain to continuously remain so we who live above the drowned world may have a chance to remember for longer. Thank you.